Just let me hear some of that rock and roll music. Rock and roll suicide. If there's a rock and roll head, heaven. Rolling rock, rock and rolling. Down and die. Rock and roll never forget. It's only rock and roll. Rock, rock, rock and roll. All right. Welcome to the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast. I'm Don DiMuccio. And later on in today's show, we have an interview with a true rock and roll survivor. As a member of the legendary 1970s rock juggernaut Badfinger, this singer-guitarist rose to the ultimate highs, handpicked by the Beatles themselves to record for their company Apple Records, only to endure every pitfall imaginable due to bad business decisions, thieving management, including the tragic suicides of two bandmates. But through it all, he's endured and has a new album coming out next month. Of course, I'm talking about the surviving member of Badfinger, Joey Marland. Rock and roll has had its fair share of cautionary tales, but few match the roller coaster ride of a career my guest today had as a member of the legendary 1970s band Badfinger. As the first outside act signed to the Beatles fledgling record label Apple Corps, the band racked up four top 20 hits, toured heavily, and paid the ultimate price for the crime of being too trusting of the often unscrupulous music business. But through it all, the one constant is his ability to produce truly great music. Please welcome to the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast, guitarist and singer from Badfinger, Joey Marland. Good afternoon, Joe. Good afternoon to you, Donald. How are you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. We've just went 12 rounds with technology. I did, yes. <laughs> I probably sound like I'm recording. <laughs> I, 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 Honest to God, I missed the days before cell phones, before computers, and things were just simpler. Well, you and I would probably be sitting in the same room that's, normally. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And I want to start off where I always generally tend to start off, because it seems to be the common denominator between us crazy musician types. When you were growing up in Liverpool, late 50s, early 60s, what were you listening to as a kid? Uh, well, I was listening to all the oldies like my mum and dad had. And, uh, but then I heard Elvis in 1958. Uh, I was 11 years old, and that uh, changed my life, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. And then I got into your Chuck Berry, your Carl Perkins, uh, Little Richard, all of it, really. Do you remember your first uh, single that you ever purchased? Um, no, no, no. I remember my first album. It was the Chuck Berry one with, uh, you know, where the profile of him looking on a white background? Yes. That's the one. I learned all those songs on there. <laughs> it was great. I used to play them on the street corners of Liverpool. Knock up. And what about radio? How important was radio to you? Um, pretty good. I mean, it was quite accidental that I heard Elvis Presley on there because we only had the BBC in England. But uh, there was a station out of Europe called uh, Radio Luxembourg that I soon got hip to. Through that little tiny radio station, I heard all your Tommy Tucker and the great R&B stars and started to get a little bit Tamla Motown coming in through there as well. Yeah. So really, they, they were like my favorite station at the time was Radio Luxembourg. And what sparked your interest to grab a guitar? Uh, Elvis Presley, actually. Uh, it was uh, I had blue suede shoes, and believe it or not, I'd never really been interested in the guitar. I was a normal kid playing football and uh, making bows and arrows and spears <laughs> and things like that. Yeah. And then I had blue suede shoes. I went right into the front parlor of the house, got my brother Chris's guitar out, and started to teach myself to play. I mean, it was immediate. There wasn't a day in between. It was immediate. I went right after Blue Suede Shoes, right into the front parlor and got the guitar out. And never looked back. Yeah, it really changed my life. Every day from then on, I spent, uh, when I got home from school, I'd go and get the guitar out and teach myself to play. Do you remember what that guitar was? What model? I believe it was a Hofner Senator. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't an electric guitar. It wasn't for about a year after that. My brother actually uh, joined a band in Liverpool, Tommy Somebody and the Somebodies, <laughs> and, and <laughs> he got an electric guitar. Then he got himself a Burns, uh, an English guitar. Yeah. I remember the rhythm guitar player had a Harmony Stratotone, which is an American guitar, and I spent my life searching for one of them. I eventually bought one at Willie's American Guitars in St. Paul, Minnesota, when I moved here. I've still oh, got it. Wow. It's one of my favorite guitars. Absolutely fantastic. And I would imagine, yep. like, back then, getting a Fender would have been, like, out of the question. 
Actually, in Liverpool, it wasn't that out of the question. Really? Uh, there's a, there's an article, I think, and Mick Jagger and, and Keith Richard are talking about guitars, and uh, they're talking about the Liverpool players coming down, and they'd always have Fenders and Gibsons and things like that, which were hard to get in London, believe it or not. So they were always jealous of the Liverpool players. And if you look at the old players in Liverpool, they're playing things like that. George is playing the Gretsch. Right. He got that off a seaman who brought it back from America with him. John's playing a Rickenbacker he bought in Germany, actually. But in Liverpool, we had quite a good access to guitars, yeah. When I was 15, uh, I left school and I was working, and I saved up my money and I bought myself a Gibson stereo, cherry red, just like Chuck Berry played. Yeah, I was, I was knocked out with it, yeah. <laughs> So I imagine all through those years as a teenager, you were knocking around different bands. And yeah. Tell me some of the experiences you had. The first band I played in where I made money was a band called uh, Profiles. The lead singer was my first songwriter I met. And I was knocking around already with a few musicians, but I didn't really know anybody. It wasn't until I joined those guys that I started to go to the Blue Angel and places like that and start to meet other musicians, uh, you know, on an off-duty basis. You know what I mean? Right. It took about two years to get into the scene in Liverpool and become like a musician in, involved in that scene and during that time, I met all the bands. I met, you know, who I don't know, the Swinging Blue Jeans and all those guys, the Escorts. Some of the older bands, uh, the, the uh, Searchers. Yeah. Were a, they were a band uh, generation before me, as the Beatles were. Right. You know, stuff like that. Just started to get the no musicians, really. Uh, the Roadrunners. A great, they were a great kind of uh, James Brown and the Famous Flames. Just great. Just great, great, great. <laughs> Silly question, but did you play the Cavern? Oh, yeah, we played the cavern there many times. I, the second band I joined was a band called The Masterminds. And not long after that, uh, we started to play the cavern. We got invited down there. We were the house band at the Blue Angel, which is a famous late night drinking club in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started to play the cavern. We started to do the lunchtime and the evening sessions. I'd been the cavern uh, and seen bands play when I was working as a boy. Yeah. Uh, saw the Beatles there. It was a great place, uh, not a drinking club, so I could go in even though I was only 15, you know. It was great, man. It was a knockout. It seems very small. It seems very, you know, body on top of body. It seems like a fire hazard, to be honest, when you when you look at well, some it, of the pictures. Well, it, it was a fire hazard, except for the humidity caused by the density of the crowd. Yeah. They're, you know, there'd be about 200, 300 people in that little room. Right. And it was in the basement of a seed warehouse, you know, where fruit and grain and stuff were stored. Yeah. Anyway, and down in the basement, they opened the cabin. It was a jazz club, and then it was a skiffle club, and then it was a beat club. Great place to play, great place to go and see a band, uh, see anybody. It was just a great sounding room, really dense, like you say, a lot of people, thick atmosphere. The only bad thing you could do down there was smoke cigarettes, uh, but man, it was good, and the atmosphere was fantastic. I'm actually embarrassed to admit that for many years, I did not realize that the Ivies and Batfinger's relationship with Apple and with the Beatles actually predates your joining the band. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But that said, can you give us a little backstory on how the Ivies came to their attention? The Ivies had already moved to London. Uh, Bill Collins, the, the manager from Liverpool guy, uh, he brought them to London and started to t school them in writing songs and train them to be songwriters. He figured that's where the future was. They did that, and through them writing all those songs, there was another connection. Um, Bill was a friend of Paul's father who played trumpet in a jazz band in Liverpool. Right. And Bill played piano in a jazz band in Liverpool. Not the same band, but he knew him through that scene, you know. Yeah. So when the Ivies got to London and started writing songs and making tapes, found out the Beatles were recording, and they were, he also found out they were starting a record label. And he took the tapes down to Abbey Road, talked his way into to Abbey Road. He was an old scouser, and he said he knew Paul's dad. So they took him in. And he got in to see the Beatles and he talked his way uh, with Paul McCartney and he ended up giving him a tape of the Ivies songs. One way or another, he hustles out of here into a deal for the Ivies at Apple. Yep. And didn't Mal Evans also play a certain role in that? I think Mal had gone and seen them at the marquee. Yeah. 
uh, and they were a good little live band, you know, great vocals, great players. The bass player was, was, was extra good. Tommy was a really good guitar player. Pete was an excellent guitar player. So, and they all three of them could sing like birds. Yeah, great high voices, three-part harmonies. Uh, they had all that going and they were writing songs. So that was a lot of, a lot of good things for a band in those days. And of course, you mentioned the guitar players. Now, you were replacing a bass player. Yeah, it was, yeah. Now, what happened was, when Ron, the bass player, left, uh, Tommy decided he was going to play bass. So they started looking for a guitar player. And uh, a mate of mine, a bass player, who was a good friend of McCartney's as well, Billy Kinsley, he actually went for the job as a bass player. And when he found out they were looking for a guitar player, he recommended me for the job. That's how I got the job. And were there any any problems, any issues with Tom Evans switching from guitar to bass, or was that something he was willing to do anyways? No, he wanted to do it. Yeah, he wanted the band to have more of a solid bottom feel to it. Right. Uh, a bottom rhythm to it, a rock and roll rhythm. So he wanted to play bass with Mike, you know, and drive Mike. And he was a hell of a bass player. Yeah, it turned out that way, didn't it? Yes. It turned out great. Yeah, yes. yeah. Not a lot of guys could make that transition so easily or willingly. No. So well, Tommy, yeah, Tommy had a good gift as far as that goes. He's one of those, when he played guitar, he always knew what he was playing, you know. I mean, when I say he would, he would always go to the right note on the guitar. Right. You know what I mean? He just had a good gift for it. So, yeah, yeah, it worked out great. And I got to ask you because... You mentioned Bill Collins, and for people who don't know, that was the guy who discovered the Ivies, and kind of like a Brian Epstein figure, except he was a little bit of an older gentleman, from what I can see, moved them all into their house. You know, today, all of my red flags would be going up. Did yeah. You, did, yeah. You, did you trust him? I did, yeah. Bill was, uh, Bill was a trustworthy guy. Um, this was a guy who cashed in his life insurance policy to look after the band. Ah, okay. Um, okay. This guy had a big heart, and he loved it, and he loved the music. He, uh, you know, he, he played piano with us whenever he could. And uh, oh, that's cool. Yeah, he was a great old guy. Clear something up for me: the name Badfinger. Why was it necessary to change? You had the single out. Why the name change? And who came up with the name Badfinger? The band wanted a more rock and roll name. And there was another band in England called the Ivy League. And they were having hits at the same time. They sang in the, in the upper registers and did like three-part harmony. Uh, so there was already a band called the Ivy League. And uh, uh, it just didn't sound, you know, the Ivies didn't really sound like a you know rock and roll right. band. You know, so they wanted to change it for something. Uh, Badfinger came from the Beatles had recorded uh, with a little help from my friends. You know, the, the one Ringo did on Sergeant Pepper. And they'd already recorded a demo of that. And they called it Badfinger Boogie because uh, John played the piano. And I think he made a couple of screw ups <laughs> on, the, uh, on the piano. He played piano on the demo. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's, where it, that's where it came from. And Neil Aspinall suggested it. What about Badfinger? And, uh, you know, all the other people had suggested names. John wanted to call them the Pricks. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. You know, like Pre. Pre, like P-R-A-S. Yeah. But it was really the Pricks. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Paul wanted to call them Mother's Little Helpers. Yeah. And uh, so neither of them would <laughs> really work. But anyway, they tried, you know, the normal hundred names thing. And, and then Neil suggested Badfinger. Right. And, and everybody jumped on that right away. So, yeah, it's a cool name. Very cool name. But that first album was shelved. Is it because of Alan Klein, or what was the story behind that? No, it was uh, it was their first album, and there were great hopes for it. Tommy had written a song called Maybe Tomorrow. They'd done a, a fabulous uh, recording of it with, uh, who was the producer now? Uh, uh, Tony Visconti. Tony Visconti, yeah. Did the arrangement, did the strings and everything, and everybody had high hopes, actually really expected it to be a hit record, and it flopped. Uh, and they'd already recorded an album to go along with it. And the album was called Maybe Tomorrow. It was released in Italy, I think. But uh, there was no interest in it in England. So it was never put out. No, it wasn't. It was later put together with, the, with Come and Get It and the other three songs that Paul produced. And they took eight songs from the Maybe Tomorrow album and made a new Badfinger album out of it. You know? That first album, I tried to grab a copy. They wanted like $800 for it. Very, yeah, very yeah. How to get it's a collector's <laughs> item? Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yep. hope you saved a couple. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, again, you were not on those recording sessions. Um, no, right? no. Your first no. album was the great 
No Dice, which features a near perfect rock radio hit no matter what. Oh, yeah. Free Magazine called you guys, and I'm quoting, one fucking whale of a group. <laughs> so tell me some of the memories of your first recording sessions with the band. Uh, the first song we did was No Matter What. It was just after I joined. I joined him, I think, in November, and we started recording it in December, I believe. Come and Get It was already released, I think, in America then. Either way, it was the first song we did. Yeah. And, uh, and then we did another song of mine called Friends Are Hard to Find, which well, it wasn't put out on the first album. We did that in a little studio in London. I can't remember the name of it. It wasn't like Olympic. Or... No, it wasn't Olympic. No, I would have remembered that. Yeah. Uh, it was one of the smaller places. Uh, we went and did that. I think Mal was there when we did that record. We went and finished it at Abbey Road. I remember because I remember doing the uh, Lap Steel solo in Abbey Road in the big studio there. How come you didn't record it at Apple? I mean, that was up and running, right? Yeah, it was, but there were things wrong with it. And it was just, uh, we were going in to cut some songs because uh, the Beatles, or whoever, the powers that be, wanted us to go in and record some more songs. So yeah. that's what we were doing. So well, That album also features a uh, beautiful original song considered a rock ballad standard now, Without You. Oh, is, yeah. Of course, yeah. later made famous by Harry Nielsen. Like, they tell me Mariah Carey covered it. I don't care about that. Uh, uh, she did though yeah. a lot of other people yeah, too. I know. Yes. did you know at that time that Pete and Tom had written a masterpiece no we had no idea I actually had no idea about the song at all um, Pete and Tommy had, uh, had two separate songs and Tommy had the without you chorus and Pete had the verse but he didn't have a chorus and it was our manager Bill Collins who suggested that we try sticking those two ideas together might make up a song for us so we did. We did it at Abbey Road. Uh, took a few hours, uh, a little bit of guitar, and uh, recorded it. It turned out quite nice, and we ended up putting it on the record. Little Blues Ballad was what we thought. Yeah. Yeah, but it was nice. Uh, it wasn't until we had Harry Nielsen's version of it uh, that our manager, actually, again, Bill Collins, he was proved right because he said when we did it that he thought it was a great tune and that we should do a big version of it. He actually heard it like that, I'm sure, in his head. Yeah. And uh, a couple of years later, Harry Nielsen come down the aisle and knocked on our door and said, come and listen to this song that I've just done. And we went in the room with Harry and he played us without you, his version. Just knocked us out. We were blown away. And Bill's looking at us going, I told you so. Yeah. I told you so. <laughs> Around that time, you must have started your first tour with the band. Yeah, Come and Get It had come out, and it had been quite a big hit uh, around the world, America included, of course. And uh, we tried to get some shows on it, but it was difficult because of the nature of the song, you know. Uh, music was changing a little bit. We put No Matter What out, uh, that became a hit, and that was the grounds, really, for our big tour. We came over and got a load of dates, I think about 60 gigs, and we started playing all over America then. I think it was in 1971, was it? Uh, 70, 1970, I believe. Yeah. And uh, we came over in the fall, came into uh, Fargo, North Dakota was the first gig, I remember. Uh, and it was the first gig. Mm. And then we drove down to Minneapolis, St. Paul. And I met my future wife the next day, uh, Kathy. Uh oh. Yeah, we spent 39 years together, Kathy and I. God bless you. Yep. Yeah, God bless her. That's right. Anyway, uh, that was the start of our American career then. We started to play anywhere and everywhere they would book us. And, of course, we we went on to have several hits here, several big hits. It was great. Baby Blue, of course. Yeah. Yep, yep. And Knockout. you had worked with George on All Things Must Pass, as well as the concert for Bangladesh, quite famously. Any memories from that? Any? Oh, loads of them. Uh, loads of them, really. Uh, the George sessions... We'd go to Abbey Road each day for about two or three weeks, and uh, we'd learn some new songs with him. And we'd, we'd do all the backtracks. Uh, Ringo was there, Klaus Vorman playing bass, Billy Preston, Eric Clapton playing guitar, yeah, uh, and George, of course. And a few other people came by. Uh, I think Peter Frampton was, was on some of those sessions, there. right? Peter played on some of the lead guitar sessions when they were doing the overdubs, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And I think, uh, Who's the drummer from Genesis again? I can't. Phil Collins. He played Phil, on uh, Apple Scruffs. He played, I yeah. think, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So it was a great a great adventure for us. We were kids. You know, I was, well, I wasn't a kid. I was 23, but uh, being surrounded by rock stars everywhere I looked was unbelievable. 
As an outsider, it seems to me that the focal point in Badfinger's career came when you signed with New York City businessman, quote unquote, Stan Polly. Yeah, yeah. May he be looking up at us right now. <laughs> um, talk a little bit about him. Well, he, he was like everybody's dad when we met him. He, he was a big, tall American bloke, uh, had a big office in Central Park South, Count commendations from the New York City Police Department on the wall. We didn't know, of course, that he was a convicted felon. He was a back man. He used to carry the bribes. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was unbelievable. Uh, he had a law degree. and uh, He seemed very intelligent and very knowledgeable about the business and uh, also about the financial side of the business. Uh, he set up our corporation um, and took care of all the money. Oh, he and sure he, did. And he certainly took care of that money well. <laughs> yeah, for himself. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And, uh, of course, over the next few years, he made a fortune and cleaned us out. I don't understand where we're... Uh, and, again, I know, I know it's so easy for me to say watching a documentary or reading it in a book versus you being there and living it and being in the eye of the hurricane. But where was management? Where was Bill to look after you to say, no, don't sign this well, without... Bill didn't have the experience to deal with a, a thing like this. We were making a vast amounts of money. Uh, uh, and the, the manager, all, under the contracts we signed and the corporate papers we signed, even though we owned half of the company and he owned the other half, and they were only supposed to take uh, 30%. The other 70% was our money. But that 70% was supposed to be put in like savings accounts for us. Right. It, it never was. It was all it all went into the corporation and Polly had access to it all. Right. And and he uh, he spent he spent it willy nilly, spent it like there was no tomorrow. He spent it on Rolls Royces and flying movie producers in from Hollywood to see if he could get uh, any movies. Uh, it's just, you know, yeah. unbelievable. The uh, Plaza Hotel bills, parties, parties for the guys, and not from his uh, cut, of course. No, not from no. his cut. No, that that was all his cut. We, we we paid the expenses. I read somewhere that there was an order of his company, and that during a ten month period, I guess from between seventy and seventy one, you were paid roughly six grand a member. The company profited twenty four grand. And his commission was $75,744. It sounds impossible, but yeah, that's pretty much what happened. Uh, although the, 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 the amounts of money that I heard, because none of that, and I don't believe that you guys or whoever did that accounting, uh, counted all the publishing income and all this. Right. Record, the record royalties were phenomenal. Sure. We were, we were getting letters from Apple saying they'd just sent our management company in New York a check for £250,000. Hundreds of thousands of pounds routinely went to them in New York. And the total was eventually, in, by 74, that was up in the millions. Uh, we were up to about $6 million, $7 million uh, had gone. You saw none of it. We didn't get any of that except our routine wages. We all took wages because we wanted to save our money. Right. You know, so we took 350 a week. Uh, that was plenty for us. Sure. Uh, we'd buy a guitar here and there. Guitars weren't that expensive then. Right. Uh, none of us had a new car. Uh, none of us had a house. I rented my rented houses all the way through Badfinger. And when I left the band in late 74, uh, I had 700 bucks in the bank. Oh. To sin. That is a mortal sin. Well, before we get to uh, that, too, yeah. <laughs> how did you come about being talked into leaving Apple? We weren't talked into Apple. Apple was closing down. Apple was at the end of its run. Uh, uh, so we went. We weren't talked into that. We tried to stay with Apple. Uh, the Beatles had already given Apple to Alan Klein, you know? So we went to see a client about renewing the contract in New York. Yeah. Uh, he said, well, we'll resign you, but we're not going to pay you the royalties that we're paying you now. We'll pay you this much royalties. He offered less royalties to us, and the Beatles, uh, uh, Apple, paid all our expenses yeah. for recording and all that stuff. He said, and that's over, too. You guys will have to pay your own expenses. So, Well, then that's uh, why you left. I can see your point now. Yeah, well, our manager, uh, Polly, went to Warner Brothers. They offered us a fortune. $3 million deal. $3 million deal. Solo deals. 
yep. uh, that, we, that we could produce ourselves and uh, a deal for six Badfinger albums. And they all paid us great money. So it was really worth it for us to sign with Warners. Right. And it, it wasn't anything to do with us wanting to leave Apple. Right, right. You know, that I think, or that song Pete wrote, the first song on the last Apple album, Ass, the uh, Apple of My Eye. Uh, is the song all about that? But um, now we never wanted to leave Apple. It was great, man. They were, and they were great to us. What sure. the hell? Is this correct that when you did sign with Warner's, that Apple released an album at the same time your first Warner's album came out? So they was- did, yeah, yeah. Both the, both those albums came out at the same time. Yeah, uh, the Ass album came out, and the first Warner album, um, which was going to be called Wish You Were Here, actually, but I think it was called For Love or Money, wasn't it? Something like that. So tell me about when you did quit the band. For me, by that time, it was obvious that we were just getting ripped off and it just wasn't working. You know, uh, a couple of the members wanted to leave Polly and, uh, you know, one of the members particularly didn't want to leave Polly and one of the members was up in the air about it. But it just became just really frustrating. We couldn't get anything. We couldn't even buy equipment. We were told that we had no money. Pete didn't believe it, actually, Uh he didn't believe uh, that Polly was a crook. Uh, he didn't believe that Polly was letting us down. Uh, we were getting our wages every month, but even that stopped in, I think, July of 74. Uh, he stopped paying us wages. So even that, it's like a final he, insult. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it went all the way to that. Um, there were no gigs. It was just it was just a completely frustrating situation, and we didn't know what to do about it. Yeah. Even though we had a letter, I had a letter in my hands telling me that Apple had just paid him £200,000 in royalties. I called up to buy a tape recorder. He said, there's no money. But I knew they'd just got. And that was like $500,000 in those days, you know. Of course. Uh, So he was telling us we had no money and Apple had just sent him $500,000. Obviously, the last thing I'd ever want to do is tear open a wound. But for people who don't know, Explain how those pressures you're talking about affected Pete Ham. Well, yeah, of course, Peter, uh, when he found that out, which was 75 by the time he found that out and believed it, and his wife was going to go have a baby, and he thought by doing what he did that he would make somebody pay attention to it. You know, maybe the police would even pay attention to it. And he went out and he killed himself. He, He hung himself in his garage. Uh, he thought it would do somebody some good uh, somewhere, but I mean, I don't know why he did it really, but uh, it was it was a disaster, obviously. Uh, the band was already broken up. Polly had already broken the band up. Yeah, uh, he, He'd left everybody broke. I'd moved to L.A. by then. I uh, was living in a spare room at one of my friend's apartments. Thank, you know, thank the Lord they would let us do that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, we literally had nothing. And we weren't, we weren't like rock stars. You know, we didn't walk around, you know, feeling like we were the greatest thing in the world or anything like that. So when you're down and out in the music business and, and you've got no money, you know, and you don't have some kind of big ego to, to get yourself in the doors, it's very difficult to get work. You know, it really is because everything you did was because of the Beatles, and uh, you know it, it was it was just like that. It was cruel, but it was like that. You know, it's just the way it is. And that had to be annoying too. I mean, being compared to being compared to, that had to drive you crazy. I did for a while at the very beginning, but we soon forgot about it because we were really pretty successful in our own right. And uh, if we could have just kept on playing and doing what we were doing. We would have been all right. You know, it would have worked out great. We just happened to get mixed up with that guy and and his his way way of looking at the world, you know. So uh, there was nothing we could do about it. And the band started to disagree with itself, you know. And a a band is like a... I said to somebody the other day, the band is like an egg, you know, and you crack that shell. It starts to run out, the spirit of the band. Sure. You know, the actual thing that makes the band good uh, starts to disappear. And that happened to Badfinger. Yeah. There was no way around it. We didn't, I didn't think we wanted to break up. I didn't hate Pete. I don't think he hated me. Right. Tommy and I didn't hate each other. And Mike and I played for years to come. That's right. Tommy and I went on to make records together. So um, it, was just, it was just a disaster in, in, all, those, in all those ways, you know. Sure. Silly. Silly. Well, I want to take a point of personal privilege here. 
When I was 13, I was lucky enough to see you. And it was I looked it up. Sunday, August 5th, 1984, at a club in Providence, Rhode Island called Lupo's. And it oh. was the 20th anniversary of British Rock. And, wow. And I got, got wow. To, I got to meet you. It was uh, Jerry Marsden, Billy J. Kramer, Herman Hermits, the Trogs. But I, I was yeah. I was I was there to see you guys, and that's the God honest truth. And I was I was lucky to be there too. I guess there was an afternoon show for all ages, and the truck broke down, so you guys never did that show. So the, ah! so the owner said, "All right, I'll sl- I'll sneak you back in later," you know. And I came yeah, in. I was yeah. lucky to see it. My point being, besides bringing my own personal anecdote in, is that you kept going. Now I don't know. Was Mike Gibbons with you on that tour? Do you remember? Yeah, he was. He was okay. Yeah, he was on that tour. Yeah. Now, Tom was alive at that time. Uh, yeah. In no, 80- Tom wasn't alive. Tom died in 1983. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was 85. No, no. Okay, so he died. Well, I mean, I know he also committed suicide. Um, yeah, yeah. We'd all been broke for years, and we had a lot of money. When when, when the band broke up, uh, Neil Aspinall, uh, who ran Apple Records and Apple Publishing, uh, they had nowhere to send the money. The royalties, because it was still coming in in large amounts. Of course. So they they started to put it in an escrow account for bad thing. Yeah. And eventually, uh, Neil went to court, and he gave all the money to the court in London. And he, he had a thing called an interpleader put together, and the court agreed to set up a bank account for the band, and all the royalties would be paid into that. And we could only get those royalties when all four of us, or, you know, like Pizza State and the other three of us, and Bill Collins, because we were all partners, uh, would make an agreement uh, that would decide where the money went, who got how much of the money. Yeah? Because it wasn't a simple division between all of us. And Pete had written the big hits. And, right. you know, Tommy and he had written Without You. And we'd all, I'd written over half of the other songs. Sure. Um, and so, we, and, you know, we all had a good bit of money coming. And there was a lot of artist royalties in there, too, that we all split equally. So we had to agree to that. Now, Pete's family was, was unaware, really, of any agreements between the band. And... Uh, you know, Tommy, well, different people were, were were in different moods about how the money should be split. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bill wanted to uphold the original agreement that they'd had. They had it before I joined the band. I just came party to it when I joined. And I, they made me sign to it, actually. And that was a, 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 involved the publishing royalties. Right. So so that was a kind of a, a bit of a, a bit of a thing. Uh, that caused the delay in the thing. Um, I don't want to go into the details of it, only because it doesn't really affect me. But it affected uh, it affected Tommy's story, and yeah. it affects uh, it affects his and Mike's relationship, really. Yeah. But um, anyway, uh, we all ended up going to court in 1985 just to get through this. Actually, and let you know this. Yeah, we went to court in London in 1985 and divided the money up, uh, as as we all agreed to divide it. Everybody got their money, everybody got their share, and it was enough money for me to come back to America and buy a house with. Nice. That's yeah. how much money there was there. Sure. Uh, which and it was a great thing for me. And since 1985. All of us have gotten our share of that money, and okay. share of the, and, and, and an even share of the bad thing of royalties that have been accrued since then. Ah, oh, so it has been worked out. So yet it all worked out. Uh, Tommy's family's been raised. Well, you know, his wife's got all his money. Uh, Pete's family and his wife got all his money. Mike's family's got all his money, yeah. and Joe's family's got all his yeah. money. So we're all good. And Bill Collins gets his money too. You know, you know that's why I started this off by saying it's a cautionary tale because it's you just gotta you gotta live long enough and survive to see the story through because what you're feeling today may not be what reality is going to be tomorrow. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah, yeah. nobody knows what's going to happen know. tomorrow. Nobody knows that. Everyone should pray for uh, Pete Ham and Tom Evans because yeah, uh, it's a shame. Yeah. And I and Mike passed, I guess, from an aneurysm in two thousand five. You're the last yeah. surviving member, right? Yeah. yeah, I am. I am. Yeah. Speaking of surviving, you're doing great, and you got a new album coming out. Talk a little yeah, bit about yeah. that. Yeah, I've got a new record coming out. I can't believe it. Um, <laughs> 
you know, over the years, I've made I've made a lot of great friends in this music world, and uh, one of them is a guy named Mark Hudson. Oh yeah, uh, great guy. Great, yeah, great guy. We have a lot of laughs together, and uh, you know, when, whenever we're together, we sing no matter what together and stuff. <laughs> and uh, he's a great player, a great great singer, great performer, and a great producer. And all these years I've known him, I've been trying to get him to produce a record for me. <laughs> and well, about two years ago, he said to me, hey, let's make that record. So we was able to raise a bit of money and uh, we were able to get started on it. And we did. And uh, we just finished it early this year. Cutting a long story short here. <laughs> I did it in New York, a lot of real musicians, a lot in a real studio, real Grammy winning engineer, Mario McNulty. Nice. And, uh, just fantastic, and the record turned out really, really good. You know, for I was knocked out with it myself. Uh, for, you know, for a record, it sounds like a record. You know, when you listen to it, it actually sounds like a real record. Not something it, produced on a computer. No, it oh. doesn't sound like that. It oh. doesn't sound like that. And we did, <laughs> we did, we did it all like that. We did all whole songs. We didn't do any. Uh, cut and paste, cut and paste things. Right. We did it all as whole songs, live back tracks. Steve Holly played drums, great drummer. Oh, he's fantastic, uh, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of great players. So. Do you have a title yet? Well, it's the, the album's called Be True to Yourself, and uh, it's coming out on Omnibore Recordings. Okay. Uh, and the first single's out now. It's called Rainy Day Man. It's getting good reviews. And we're going to play it. Yeah, yeah, uh, please uh, play it. From the forthcoming release, Be True to Yourself, that's the great Joey Marlin with his new single, Rainy Day Men, which is available on Amazon, iTunes, and all that crap. I don't 